the same answer. I'll just go for uh, this presentation. Okay. So, for anesthesia in a post heart transplant, you must understand the uh, changes or physiology of a transplanted heart. That is how you start the answer. So, it involves removal of the diseased heart, unlike uh, uh, your renal transplant, where you leave the diseased kidneys inside and keep the new kidney in the uh, iliac fossa. It doesn't happen. You have to remove the diseased heart and the aorta and main pulmonary artery may be transected and the heart is partially denervated. So once you remove the diseased heart, uh, the heart becomes denervated and the atria of the recipients may be remain innervated by the uh, conduction does not occur across the suture line. So up to the suture line, it will be still active. That is why you get the native uh, atrium also contracting. And you get the double P wave because of that. If they do a biatrial anastomosis instead of the aortopulmonary anastomosis. And uh, the heart can still also, the, the transplanted heart activate is uh, working because of the intrinsic mechanism of its. Uh, uh, all of you would have uh, done as a uh, biology student where you take out the heart of a frog and keep it in the uh, the line it beats uh, for quite some time in spite of uh, removing it and then mounting it on a board. It keeps contracting. So that is uh, the intrinsic cardiac mechanisms which continue in our uh, transplant also. And it is uh, extremely sensitive to loading conditions. And so it is called as a preload dependent uh, output. And so the venous return is very, very important. And uh, the heart rate is always higher. After the transplant, the transplanted heart is always beating at about 90 to 110 per minute with a maximum heart rate and minimum heart rate with a reduced heart rate variability. It will not uh, show the same change that happens because of the respiratory expressions that normally happen in a healthy person and uh, because of the absence of parasympathetic innervation. And uh, they may have a uh, mm -hmm normal sinus rhythm, but an increased refractory period of the sinus node. And may have first degree heart block is always common. That is the prolongation of the PR interval is uh, very common in these patients. And the uh, majority of them may have also have a pacemaker implanted along with that heart transplantation done. And uh, the possible reasons for this heart block include biatrial anastomosis, where the innervation has been cut and the now conduction does not cross the suture line or organ rejection or nodal ischemia or inadequate myocardial preservation. All these things are the causes of heart block in a transplanted heart. And clinically significant atrial and ventricular arrhythmias are quite frequent and the ectopic beats are also quite common. But uh, fatal ventricular arrhythmia means it may be acute rejection or allograft coronary artery disease. Okay. What is mentioned as uh, vasculopathy, and the ECG always shows two P waves. You can see here there is a distinct first P wave, second P wave, followed by the QRS. And QRS is also a little bizarre with a little wider duration. And the tachycardia in response to physiological stress is completely blunted, whether for pain, for hypovolemia. In all these things, the normal response of tachycardia will not happen in a heart transplant patient. So that is a very, very important point that you have to remember. And uh, thoracic sinus massage or valsalva to reduce any SVT is also not effective in the heart. And the risk of atrial flutter and fibrillation may happen a few years later. And uh, gradually, over a period of time, some degree of innervation will happen the nerves start growing, but complete neuronal control is prescribed only after 15 years of transplant if the patient is lucky enough to survive until his surgery time. And uh, this patient may complain of angenial pain or vasovagal episodes and however in a cardiac arrest after neostigmine if this is administered in this patient. So better to avoid neostigmine, don't use neostigmine for reversal. Rather, as you mentioned, you can go for pseudomodex and uh, 
towards rocconium. But if you are using short-acting drugs like cis or atracurin, you can wait for sufficient time and they will get eliminated automatically and there may be no need for using new signal for reversal. And the coronary autoregulation remains intact in this patient. PA pressure and pulmonary capillary pressure remain elevated during the first month after transplant. But by one year of time, it all stabilizes. And the systemic vascular resistance is frequently elevated in these patients. And mitral and tricuspid valve regurgitation may also be present. Myocardial function is subnormal during stress and exercise with a low peak heart rate because heart rate cannot increase according to the stress, as I said earlier. And there is lack of efferent cardiac innervations. Uh, so, suboptimal anotropic response will be there. Now, perioperative concentrations in these patients, they are on immunosuppressants and their interaction with commonly used drugs to be taken care of. So, the major side effects of immunosuppressants are, uh, it can be in the form of fever, anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hypertension, diabetes, renal dysfunction, neurotoxicity and osteoporosis. So, these are the unwanted effects of all the immunosuppressant patients. You must have knowledge regarding post-transplant complications and their implications in anesthesia practice, like infection, rejection, holograph, vasculopathy, and miscellaneous. Coming to pre-operative assessment and pre-medication, the transplant team, as well as the attending anesthesiologists and surgeons, should have good coordination during pre-operative period. What are the investigations? ECG to assess graft function and arrhythmias. Endomyocardial biopsy, if necessary, to rule out rejection. Echocardiography to assess the ventricular function in detection of allograft vasculopathy. Quaternary angiography, if it is reserved only for patients with the sus suspected allograft vasculopathy. Now, laboratory parameters CBC, electrolytes, renal function, LFT, biomarkers like brain activity peptide to have a role in detection of allograft rejection in coronary vasculature. So, BNP should be estimated. And the established patient's exercise tolerance. Ask them how much uh, meds they can cover. It's a very important point. And the dose of immunosuppressant should not be altered and should be continued post-operatively to reduce the, the risk of rejection. Now, supplemental steroids are not necessary for stress coverage except in post-transplant recipients in whom steroids are recently withdrawn. So if they are already on steroids, it will be continued. But if they have withdrawn steroids, then only you have to think of that. Intraoperative concerns and anesthetic techniques, all techniques have been tried, local, regional, neuroleptic and all that. And between general anesthesia and regional anesthesia, no technique has been found to be better. But the main is to maintain the preload. As long as the venous return is maintained, the patient's heart will function normally. So, but GA is usually preferred because of the mm -hmm. impaired response to hypotension after spinals. And uh, oral endotracheal intubation is always preferred to nasal intubation because of the risk of infection caused by nasal flora. Avoid hyperventilation in these patients taking cyclosporine because it decreases the seizure uh, threshold of these two drugs and patient may throw a fit. And the loss of sympathetic response to laryngoscopy and intubation will be there. Laryngeal mask airway is not contraindicated. So, if you are confident in using a LMA, you can definitely use it. And the denervated has a blunted heart rate response to inadequate anesthesia also. So, it is a very challenging task to find out whether the patient has been adequately anesthetized and given analgesia or not. So, NSAID drugs should be avoided and for pain control because of the risk of bleeding. Isoprenaline and dobutamine have similar effect on the transplanted heart. So, if there is bradycardia, your atropine will not work as Risha correctly said. You have to use only these two drugs. Atropine has no effect. So, isoprenaline should be readily available to manage bradycardia and hypotension. Postoperative care, 
increase attention should be paid to the preload status renal function and prevention of infection these are the three important things immunosuppression should be continued post operatively and blood level is monitored and uh, so these are the points that you have to uh, it's a very easy question to answer if you know these basic things so you divide the answer into what are all the physiological changes that happen in the transplanted heart which are uh, important from anesthesia point of view like uh, mm. you cannot use neostigmine antropin will not have a normal effect all these things are based on the understanding the uh, behavior of the transplanted heart so if you know that you can answer this question very well well done rishabh that's a very good question